Okay, so this presentation is based on a book I, re I wrote. Um, we can talk about the book after the presentation if you're interested. We've got a fair amount of time uh, after this, so I'll be available for questions. So let me start by introducing myself. This is me. As you can tell, I've been at this for a while, and this is what I do. Okay, lots of security consulting, lots of, uh, you know, some credentials, and uh, basically I got tired a while back of uh, security failure and started looking at how people fail, how businesses fail, and trying to find ways to uh, improve uh, the way that things work. And that's why I created my company. My company is uh, about trying to solve fundamental problems, not just taking standard approaches, uh, you know, doing assessments, figuring out what's going on, and focusing on iterative improvement and learning. Um, so with that little introduction, let's get into the basics. Now, if you're here, you're gonna be looking for a job in probably a year. Who's looking for a job in the next year? Okay, year after that? few people, you've got anybody further back in their career plan, you've got, okay, anybody closer, anybody looking for a, year, a job like tomorrow, anybody, in, okay, good, so you've got a year lead time, which is pretty critical for how this process works. The, fundam the fundamental idea here is in this year that you have to work with, you want to build an assortment of online presence, you know, Websites, blogs, presentations, articles, books, if you have the time to write a book, most of you probably won't be writing a book in the next year. Uh, but that's the sort of thing you wanna be thinking about. And the reason is, if you don't take control of your online presence, what's going to be out there is going to be ad hoc, just sort of what's accumulated over the last several years as you've been kind of living life. And that means that if a, a prospective employer does a search on you, that's what they're gonna find. Now, there have been numerous people out there that have lost jobs because of Twitter postings, because of photos on Facebook or Instagram, and if you want to get in front of that, you can clean up some of your, your past, but more importantly, put useful stuff out there. It's going to rise to the top of the search engines, and you're going to have a lot less to worry about. Um, without this foundation in today's economy, your job search is going to fail. Why is it going to fail? because other people are doing this sort of online repository, you know, portfolio building. And you're up against other people that look a lot like you. They're gonna have similar education, they're gonna have similar backgrounds, they're gonna have worked on projects. And anybody that has one more credential or has worked on one more interesting project or published one more article is gonna be above you in the stack of people looking for employees. Um, Okay. The other aspect behind this whole process is uh, you want to find a job that matches you. Most people, when they graduate, or when they're just looking for a job after the, the one that they had goes away, they look for the next available job. Now, does anybody remember those, those little kids games that have the different shaped blocks and you have to fit them in the box? Do you remember that? Okay. That's how the job market works. The company is the box and they're just looking for somebody with the right shape to fit in. What you want to do is carve your own shape that fits you. Because if you can do that, you're the only one that fits that job. And your competition goes quickly to zero. And that's really what this process is about. Now, how do you do this? Um, you can look, you need to understand time management. You need to un, you know, have a website that controls how you are viewed on the internet. You need to find a way to make your hobbies and what makes you unique as an individual visual. Most people are visually based, and if you have uh, something visual on your site, a set of YouTube videos, a set of articles, something like that that people can look at and say, I remember this person, that's gonna make you more memorable, that's gonna make you rise above everybody else. Uh, social engagement, whether it's through LinkedIn groups, Facebook postings, Twitter, uh, are important, and then blogging is important too. So we're gonna talk about all of these you know, as we go through this process. But step one is to own the internet. This is a search on my name on uh, Google, Bing, and Yahoo. 
and these are the hits that match me. <coughs> when I started this, I wasn't on here at all. Okay? Uh, this is in some ways basic search engine optimization, but in other ways it's custom crafted so that the items that match you are specifically where you want them on the searches. Now, how do you do this? You, know, you can't really take a year off, generate content, and throw it out on the internet so everything matches. You're going to need to repurpose um, old content. Now, if you're in school, you have a little bit more flexibility. You know, a lot of the work you've done, a little bit of work can make it public. Um, many of your professors, if you're nice to them, may help you turn school papers into something that's more capable, more useful uh, for a general audience on the internet. Um, it's not hard to take a, a paper or to take a project you worked on and condense it down to five minutes for the average person, record that, and throw it online. Um, if you have skills outside of IT and outside of information security, those can be really powerful in helping get your message across. If you are a musician, or if you're an artist, or a photographer, something like that, uh, you can make your presentation stand out, and by doing so, make the YouTube videos or whatever's popular at the time you graduate uh, become more useful and more memorable. Uh, within a work environment, you may find uh, it difficult to repurpose work material. You, know, you may need to get permission from your boss, but what tends to work better is to get involved in marketing groups. Uh, as an IT person, it's far too easy to become invisible, to be put in the background, and people only notice you when their system goes down. And that's a position you do not want to be in, because that means every interaction with you is going to be negative. And in order to get a positive interaction, you need to get in front of people. You need to find a way to do things that directly <coughs> help them instead of being the one they call when things are busted. Uh, if you have time, get involved with volunteering, get involved with open source communities. Uh, when I say open source, I do not mean programming. There are a lot of programmers out there. Um, anybody here of Heartbleed? Okay. Programmer created that whole problem, basically uh, caused an issue for the entire world. What's more valuable and much rarer in the open source community are people that do debugging, people that do troubleshooting, ticket handling, and documentation. There's wide gaps in almost all projects in those areas, and you can just step into one and with very little work make a name for yourself. Uh, freelance work is also an option, uh, probably a little bit harder where you are right now, uh, but as your career advances, it's gonna become easier and easier to get freelance work, and a lot of people find that after focusing on it for three to five years, the freelance income matches the regular job income. And it's a way to double your salary without necessarily needing to get another job with a higher salary. Um, software development is a classic way to do that. You can also, you know, write, writing articles, writing manuals, writing books, uh, online how-tos, building infrastructure. A lot of nonprofits uh, have the money to buy the equipment, but not the money to hire somebody to help them get things set up. So that's a little bit of work that can be helpful there. Um, there are some tax advantages for doing things that way too if you find yourself in that position. And then managing systems for nonprofits. If you're in a management, um, IT management position for a nonprofit or something like that, that's another uh, reference that you can use when you go for the next job search. And what's, pow what's powerful there is since that is a freelance or an ancillary job, you don't need to worry about them knowing you're looking. So one of the hardest parts about getting your second job or your third job is how do I get a reference for how good I am without letting work know I'm looking? And you do that by doing work outside of work to build the reference and to build the networking you need. Okay? Now normally I have a talk about uh, when to leave a business. Uh, most of you are probably not fully employed right now, so I'm just gonna skim over this really quick. Okay? Most businesses go through a standard pattern of growth. Start with one or two people, and uh, they just do what needs to be done to keep the clients happy. Uh, doesn't matter what the rules are, doesn't matter you know, what the policy is, you just get the job done and move on to the next thing. It's what I call cowboy style management. <coughs> As the business grows, you know, they bring in people, uh, often an office manager, sometimes an accounting person, and rules start to form. And, uh, but you pretty much trust one another to get the job done right and that's the trust-based management model. 
as the company grows bigger and you start adding layers of middle management, you need more and more rules. And it becomes more common to be told, oh, we can't do this, it's against policy. Okay? That's the lightly structured management. And then eventually, you know, the bigger company gets, the more um, it, it, it becomes less of a, hey, I have an idea, how can we get this done within the policy? And more about, I have an idea, but it's never gonna fly here because policy forbids it, because culture forbids it. Most people will find, as they go through their career, they're happier in one of these roles, in one of these types of businesses. And when the business shifts, you know, whether it's a, a large business that is uh, shrinking because the, econ the economy is having problems, or whether it's a small business that's growing, you hit a transition point and you're no longer comfortable. And that is often a good time to leave. Now, a little bit on resumes. Okay, who's actually <coughs> written a resume? Okay. Most resumes are a waste of time. And the reason they're a waste of time is whenever there's a job opening, hiring managers get a deluge of these resumes that come in. If it's in it's, and if it's an entry-level job, they all look exactly the same. There's no experience there. There's nothing um, distinguishing one person from another, same classes, same schoolwork, same sorts of jobs in college, and nobody reads them all. So what happens is people filter them, and they filter them uh, quickly. So one common filter technique is everybody who doesn't have a college degree is thrown out. If that stack is still too big, everybody who doesn't have a certification gets thrown out. If that's still too big, everybody who doesn't have work history, Everybody who hasn't been involved in uh, social clubs gets tossed out. The goal is to get it down to under 20. And if you're down to under 20 resumes, then people actually read them. Okay. And today, this is automated. All of the online job systems, uh, whether it's LinkedIn, Monster, uh, Dice, you know, they all are based on making it easier for hiring <coughs> managers to filter you out, not select you in. So you have to be really careful in how you do this, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, cover letters. Who's written a cover letter? Okay, who thinks they're actually read? Most cover letters are also not read. Um, used to be cover letters made sense because resumes would arrive in envelopes, and nobody wants to read a resume in an envelope, so there's a cover letter that says what the resume says, so you get through that process faster. But today, things are coming in an email, and there are a lot more of them. So most people don't bother with those. But the goal of a cover letter still matters. You, know, you want to grab somebody's attention, and you have 5 to 30 seconds in which to do it. You can do this traditionally with a you know, standard cover letter and hope people read it. But what tends to work better is uh, infographics. A lot of people grasp infographics much quicker than text. Uh, that's a whole too long to read problem. Um, you can have a custom website and hope it pops up on search engines. There have been people that have done custom websites and then paid for Google AdWord campaign against the company they're targeting to make sure that company is more likely to read their, their website, which becomes the cover letter. The fundamental idea here is explain the benefits of hiring you and ask for a meeting. That's all it's supposed to do. Most people think this letter is to explain why I'm awesome. And that's not true. The letter is to ask for a meeting. And it's a lot easier in a very short period of time to say, I'm interesting, come talk to me, than this is why you should hire me. It's a multi-step process. So how do you do that? Humans are hardwired for story. There's some very interesting neurological and um, historical evidence that what distinguishes humans from other apes is our ability to share knowledge with one another and not needing to experience things directly. And we do that mostly through story. Uh, people like to know meaning. You know, we want to learn from others. And uh, we have to be interesting without being arrogant. Being arrogant is one of the biggest failings that uh, college students have because there's very little history there to tell stories from. And uh, so you need a story. And how do you get the stories? You do this, I do it with index cards. 
Now, there may well be apps coming out that do something similar. If there are, please tell me. But uh, what I do is I take a stack of index cards and I list on each card one problem I've helped solve. That's all you do. You go through the stack while you're watching TV, you know, an entire evening, write down every problem you've experienced in your life on a card. And then when the card's full, when hours have gone by, you can't think of anything else, go through them again. And on each card, write who is affected by this problem. That becomes the cast of characters for your story. Then you say, of these characters, with whom would the with would any possible interviewer be sympathetic? Okay, that becomes your hero. And then what challenges stood in the way? Why do those challenges happen? That starts to form the villain of the story. And then, you know, what didn't work? You know, those are the hurdles that the hero encounters as they go through the problems that they're they're dealing with. And then how did the lead character win? Okay, that's the denouncement or the, the, the end of the story. So you have all this data on the front of each card, and then flip over the card and summarize the whole thing in a single line. Okay, one sentence um, written, uh, I don't know what the character count is, but try to make it so Times New Roman 12, one line on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. Okay, why? That becomes the point <coughs> of your resume. Okay, resumes in general aren't read when you're trying to get hired. But resumes are always read in an interview. And having a document that has a bunch of points in which each one has a story that you can tell in which you're the hero becomes a very powerful tool for getting a job. Now what you do is you put all these stories in chronological order, put them in a document, and don't worry about how long it is. Okay? Just one document could be 10 pages, hopefully it's not 20 pages but of interesting stories you can tell. Because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be cutting this down to make a custom resume for each job you're going after. Now, you need to think about how to talk about yourself. And to do this, use an interest building structure. Okay. The idea here is to plant an initial hook, you know, why this is interesting, and then talk about it, but do not fully resolve the hook. You, know, you can say, you know, I went to school for four years, I was president of several groups, and leave it there. And they can start asking, well, what kind of groups? And you start talking about that, but don't fully resolve anything because you want them to get to a point where they say, um, so tell me more about this club you were in. Okay? And in that club you say, well, in that club I led several groups, uh, I worked on several projects, I did some things that helped these people, and kind of leave it out there, but again, several questions. You want to leave them with several questions in their mind, so you can lead through a much longer conversation, and then, when they're interested in you, you can plant the primary hook, which is, you know, interview me. You know, let's actually have a real deep conversation about what I can do for you, okay? And as you go through this process, you're going to find three types of people. You're going to find highly distracted, people, highly distracted people. These are people that will give you between one half and two minutes. Okay, that's all you'll have to get to the point of saying, you know, I'm interesting. Talk to me more. Okay, a uh, good way to do this is practice the basic storytelling you've got and make record yourself and make sure you can talk without saying um and uh and stuff like that. You want it to flow through as smoothly as possible because each interjection like that you make is a point where they will lose interest in you. <coughs> Second type of person you'll meet are attentive people. They will give you between three and five minutes to talk. And this is where narrative structure comes in. In three to five minutes, you can actually tell a story. You can lay the groundwork and you can you know, talk about the hero's journey, talk about the problems you faced and how you fixed them. Okay? Practice with a timer. Within three minutes, for every story on your card, you know, work off of the other side, the one that just has the quick summary. Within three minutes, explain why the problem mattered, how it affected people, what problem-solving process you used, attempted solutions and challenges, and what the final solution was. It sounds hard, but with just a little bit of practice, you can get each story down to three minutes. The final type of person you'll meet are the involved people. 
Uh, these are the ones uh, that are very interested in you, want to know your entire life story, and you have the risk of them wasting your time. Okay? To practice against those types of people, use your friends. Practice with friends, go to networking groups. It's easy to get invited as a guest to various networking groups like BNI, and just go there and practice telling your story and letting the story flow to fill the available time. When you have that, you can start socially engineering your audience. Social engineering is a fancy term in information security for manipulate the heck out of. Okay? There are many variants. What I do here is talk about an interest curve. Okay? I mentioned the hooks. I mentioned in the flow of a conversation, you want to drop something of interest that you can come back to later. And most people, when they're interviewing, say, I want to tell my life story and then I'm done. And if you're talking to anybody and they just tell you a life story and they're done, the conversation's over. There's no point to have another conversation. But if you have a conversation and you start telling a life and story and you start involving things that interest them, you know, you, you plant a hook here, you plant a hook here, by the end of the conversation, by the time time runs out on their schedule, they haven't gotten to the end of your life story. All they've gotten is a bunch of things that interest them and they're going to have you back for the next round. And hopefully, they'll bring somebody else in on that discussion, maybe their boss that could hire you. Okay? Incompleteness is critical for persuasion. If people like to understand, and once they understand, they're done. Okay? If everything's fully explained, there's no reason to have you back. They've satisfied their curiosity. The storyteller's goal is to keep the audience interested in the tale. And the job seeker's goal is to get hired. Thus, you have to stop your story before the end of the story, or there's no reason to have another discussion. So, that's the basic concept. <clears throat> who do you use? Who do you target? Okay? You have to think about what you want. Don't just apply to open positions. If you apply to open positions, it's a great way to waste five to ten years of your life as you try to figure out what you want. It's better to spend a week or two, and take a vacation, spring break, summer break, whatever. Just take a couple of weeks and figure out what you want to do. And then score this. You know, figure out what tasks are interesting. You know, do I want to work with Python or do I want to work with Perl? You know, what kind of size business do I want? What kind of salary do I want? How far, how long do I want to travel? Stuff like that. And then score it. And then you know, identify the different businesses. Each business gets a score. And then you have your ranked list. You know at the end which ones you want to work on first. You can pick your targets. Okay? This is a pretty small, straightforward way to do this. Now, I'm about to get into some things that uh, could be interesting, could get you into trouble, so you have to be careful. The rest of this presentation is about intelligence gathering. Okay? Companies and the people you will be targeting have not given you permission to get this data. Now, all of this data I'm talking about is public data. There are ways to get private data, and almost all of those ways will be illegal and unethical. Um, but I have to stress, other interviewees will be doing this. Okay? I, have, I haven't written a whole lot of books, but of the books I've written, the book this presentation is from is by far the most pirated book I've ever done. There's a lot of interest in this topic. And there are a lot of people using these sorts of techniques. And if you don't, you will be left behind. Now, the tools I'm mentioning, all of the tools are legal today in the US. If you're looking for a job in another country, that could be a problem. If laws change, it could be a problem. But right now, they're all legal. But they can be used unethically. So think about how that works. Think about how this could benefit you and how it could harm you. The burden is on you to understand how they work and to understand how they could be misused and to draw that line for yourself. Okay? <clears throat> the other thing is, as you go through this process, you'll learn a lot of information about people. Some of the information you may not want to know. Okay? People have private lives. People keep things private for a reason. And some of the things that you find might be unpleasant and might actually make being interviewed difficult. So understand where your lines are, what you want to know, what you don't want to know. And if you start getting into a territory that's uncomfortable, stop. Any questions before we go on? 
Yes. Could you give an example of what you mean by like women and um, Okay. So like, uh, the, okay, two, two types of lines. Okay, one line would be somebody's personal preferences. So there are websites out there uh, that people use to find, you know, um, hookups, for lack of a better term. And uh, if you find a profile on a site like Flickr or a site like Facebook, uh, and you do a search on that name, that name could show up on uh, other sites. And if you navigate to those sites, you might find out information about sexual preferences uh, or about cheating uh, that you know you don't want to know. So that's one area. This is, this is more the interviewer, not the business. Uh, yes, when okay. you're targeting in interviewers. Okay, yeah. yeah, I was confused. Okay, sorry. Any other questions? All right. Um, so, Google. Everybody's used Google, right? Google's a lot more than a search engine. Who's used operators in Google? Okay, a few people. Operators are how you target specific searches. Uh, you can search on specific sites. What's powerful about the site operator on Google is you can search through a site using Google in ways the site doesn't allow you. LinkedIn is the classic example. There are certain types of searches LinkedIn wants to charge you a lot of money to do, but they make that information open to Google. So Google uh, can rank LinkedIn higher on the searches to make LinkedIn look better. And if you know how to use the operators, you can dig into some of that data. <coughs> Google has a news search. News searches are useful because you can find out how your target firm is uh, depicted in the news. You can search on company name, officers, and products. Okay? Mapping. Everybody's used Google Maps. It's good for directions unless you're driving to Mankato. Um, also good to find alternative addresses for a business. If you know an alternative address and you can search on that address in regular Google, you can find user group meetings and things like that that are available. And that's a good way to get into a business to look through how the business actually looks inside without being interviewed first. Uh, Google Groups uh, does forums and some Usenet postings. Usenet's kind of uh, reducing in terms of what they're making available. They leak information about technology and about the people inside the businesses. Blogging is useful. If you know who's going to interview you and you can find their blog, then you're in a position where you can find out what they care about. If you know what they care about, you know how to plant the hooks in the conversation. Um, patent searches, if a company is big enough to have patents, the patents are public. If you do a patent search, you can read the patent and you know exactly how their technology functions, which is more than most people working in the business themselves would know. And finally, Google code searches allow you to get a sense of developers' code style technologies used, all of which can be very useful in custom crafting your resume and in having the discussion with the individual people. And then there are other search engines. Bing um, has what's called an events subsearch. It's a good way to find interesting meetings at a location or linked with a company. There's a search, a search engine called Yippee, which does metadata remixing and allows you to do deeper searches through iterations on searching. Uh, Xquick and Dogpile search several search engines at once. Uh, Yacy is a peer peer-to-peer -peer distributed search that's harder to set up, but can get you information you can't get anywhere else. And uh, there are several others. So explore the alternate search ecosystem. Now, as you do this, you'll be drowning in data. So it's hard to keep track. There are a lot of note-taking systems out there. What I think works better is a plain text file. Structure a blank document and then fill it in. You know, gather timeline data, gather current data, and to gather email format. <coughs> email formatting is the type of format a business's email address uses. And why does this matter? This matters because you'll be finding emails and you'll be finding names. And if you know the format, you can gather names from emails and emails from names. And that'll just help you get more things to search on, more information to dig into. Now you can automate some of this. 
There's a Python script called Harvester that's really good at finding email addresses and finding web hosts. And then for each one of those, <coughs> you can do a second set of searching to figure out you know, more information. You could do LinkedIn site searches to identify titles. These would be potential interviewers. Okay. Um, these could be people like editors, project managers, uh, the CIO. You know, some companies have multiple CIOs. Um, you can look for directors, you can look for managers. Okay. Um, there's a company out there called Market Visual that allows you to search on a company name and a title. It gives you a massive list of people because it's not people who have just had that position today, but people that have had it in the past. And uh, that means if you know who had the position in the past, you might set up an informational interview with them to get more information to do well in the interview you want to set up with the real business. Jigsaw, Salesforce, at data.com, and Hoover's are all uh, aggregators of, of data. Um, you often have to pay for this data, but your school may have a license. You know, you just get the information. Um, this is designed for salespeople, but because it's designed for salespeople, it has all of the decision makers in a business, their email addresses, their phone numbers, everything you need to target a business. Okay. And uh, lastly, since this is a somewhat technical group, uh, look at a tool called Recon NG. This is next generation recon tool. Um, learning curve is rather high, but it includes searches for almost everything on the internet. And it's uh, one of the most powerful tools out there. <clears throat> now that you have the basic info, you get to extrapolate. By looking at uh, what a business has done, what a business's products are, you can guess the problems the business has tried to solve. And if you know what the problems the business is encountering are, you can position yourself as a possible solution. Do press release searches to find out what the firm is doing. Search into the past to find out what they've done in the past. If you see a press release that says a business has entered a partnership with another business, and then that other business has never been mentioned in the next two years, you know, that partnership went badly, but you don't know why. So look on the other business's name. Try to figure out what happened to that business to have affected this partnership. Okay. Look at the business competition. Look at their history. What have they tried? What's worked? What has failed? And realize no firm is perfect, and no firm fully follows best practice. So it's easy to find these gaps and to propose solutions. The second thing you're going to want to do is find out information about the people you'll be interviewing with. That could be through titles. That could be through uh, other discussions with people that have interviewed there. There's lots of ways to get that sort of information. You also want to look at finances. Companies that don't have money are less likely to take a risk on you. Companies that are losing money but still have some to burn are more likely to take a risk because they want to stop the money loss. Companies that are growing and want to expand into new markets are more willing to take risks on you too. And you do this, public companies look at Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, and the SEC filings. Actually read the most recent SEC filing. There's a lot of information there. Uh, do a news search, Google News search for company name and loan. A lot of private businesses will get interest-free or, um, or um, not recoverable, forgivable loans. And uh, that will tell you that they're expanding or that they're playing the government system to get the money they need to do what they want to do. Um, identify ex-employees through LinkedIn searches, through any private contacts you might have, and uh, ask those people, what do you think of this business? How is it to work there? What was their stability like? Uh, you don't just want to flat out ask, you know, how much money do they make? But uh, by asking questions about stability and about the chances that they are willing to take on trying new things, can tell you a lot about how the business is doing financially. The goal of all of this research is to find the reason why this company will hire you. Are you going to come in to make it more efficient? Are you going to come in to help them grow into a new, a new uh, business endeavor, a new market? You know, are you coming in, uh, do you have multiple language skills? Are you going to say, hey, I can open up you know, Africa, or I can open up China to your business? You know, is that something that would interest them? You know, figure out, are you going to be accelerating existing growth? Are you going to help them become profitable again, grow into new markets? Once you know the ultimate plan, you know, you can figure out how you're going to spin the discussion. 
Then you can analyze the present. Uh, Multigo is a tool that's uh, demoed here. Uh, this gives you general information, a lot of network information about how a business functions. And uh, this can be useful in finding out, you know, do they have another company running their website? You know, do they have multiple companies running their infrastructure? How, how do they connect in? How do the people involved connect to people at other businesses? Uh, certain industries have a lot of cross-connect between businesses, others really don't. A lot of your research and development companies are very private, very insular. A lot of your finance companies, your community banks, for example, have people on boards of other organizations. You know, a lot of uh, nonprofits want to get the president and the executives of a bank on their board because then they have people they can ask for money from. And uh, that would then, if you know they're interested in this organization, you can volunteer for a committee for that organization and you work your way through that social structure to get the invite to talk into the other business. Uh, Rapleaf is a company you can look at. They take a bunch of emails, and it, since you've by now gotten a list of people that work there and their email addresses, you just upload the email address to these demographics firms, and they'll come back and say, of this list of people, they'll give you the average salary, where they likely live, uh, how old they likely are, which can give you information about what it might be like to work there. Because <coughs> doing work with uh, multiracial mix of young 20-somethings is very different from working with a bunch of rich old white men. Okay? And knowing the sort of, of group you're going to go into can really help you craft your story. Um, all right. Yeah, so we talked about that. Um, digging into the past is also important. You, know, you want to identify what companies have done in the past so you don't propose an idea in the interview that's been tried and has failed. There's nothing wrong with proposing something that's been tried, but if you know how it failed, you can position it in a way that says, you know, most companies that try this, try it this way and it breaks, but if you try it this way, it's more likely to succeed, okay? Um, you want to avoid wasting time rehashing old ideas, so the interview is all about new ideas. You want to map out their internet presence. Um, there's a tool called Fierce. They can be used to find a bunch of DNS entries for a domain. Um, there are actually several tools called Fierce. And for each one of those, you can feed that information to archive.org and find out what the site used to look like. You know, um, this way you can find out by going into the past what uh, they might have tried five years ago, what they might have tried ten years ago. If you do this, you'll find businesses change their focus a lot. You know, it's a lot like um, when you're in your 20s and uh, you try to reinvent yourself, you know, every year or so uh, because you realize the person you were had flaws and you want to fix those flaws and, you know, it's easier just to try to hide them rather than to fix the fundamental issues. Businesses go through the same thing in a slightly slower cycle. Um, you want to build an organizational timeline. Determine where the business is trying to go. Guess the current goals. Are they focusing on helping existing customers? Are they focusing on finding new customers? Are they trying to shop for investors? You know, that can tell you a lot about where the business is, what matters to them, and if you don't matter to them, you can craft your story to interest them. Okay? Uh, Google Trends can be a good way to get a sense of the world as a whole. Okay? If you're targeting a company that does firewalls, okay? if you do a search on firewalls, you'll see firewalls have been around for quite a while and people are actually talking about them less. If you're working for a company that develops uh, automated drones, you'll notice people haven't been talking about drones very much until very recently and now they're talking about them a lot. So that can tell you that drone research probably has more money in it and more flexibility for trying new things. Um, then you want to do professional analysis. Okay, you want to try to identify your new boss and your team. This is the Google searches against LinkedIn that I mentioned. Uh, the Multego tool can also be used here to identify specific individuals. Once you know their names, you can start finding their personal web pages, their interests, their family information. This is very powerful. Fill in the notes with this information and then try to find personal names, uh, handles, nicknames. 
uh, profile names, uh, what we used to call NICs, um, are often used for various websites. If you know a profile name, if you can identify somebody who likes to go as you know Joe Smith one two three, you can search on Joe Smith one two three on a site like Namecheck or through a tool like Scythe, and it will tell you all of the other websites out there that have people using that nickname. And then you can find their social media presences. You can find their Facebook homepage. You can find their Twitter feed. You can find any Pinterest sites they might have. And gather that information and figure out who they are as a person, what interests them. Common example you'll encounter in IT is people have uh, favorite science fiction based TV shows. If you know that, you can spend a weekend on Netflix watching the entire thing, and then you can make references in your discussions to say, oh yes, when you know, Buffy did XYZ, or somebody from Battlestar Galactica did this, it's like this business problem, and that builds rapport really quickly. Um, okay. The basic idea here is trying to identify personality. Um, Now, there's a, an idea that I go through called metaphor mapping. And this is something I, I don't have time to get into. I actually have a full hour conversation on just metaphors. In general, a metaphor is a concept that stands for another set of concepts. It's like a compression of communication. And what you would do if you can identify the metaphors somebody else uses, you can identify how they think. And if you know how they think, you can make similar metaphors in the way you talk and build that rapport closer. It's uh, a common example in information security is you know, an unguarded flaw. You know, something most people say, yes, I know it's there, I don't have time to deal with it, is like the exhaust port on the Death Star. A lot of people in a hiring position in IT right now grew <coughs> up with Star Wars. And if you can make that sort of reference, then it's very easy to um, build that rapport and to have communication about other things. So if you know where the person grew up, how old they are, what their interests are, you can build a language around their interests, practice that language for about a week, Make sure that you know you can talk in a way that you'll be understood, and the metaphors actually mesh. Because I mean, you can really fail by having a mismatched metaphor. Um, but by knowing, you know, are they interested in TV? Are they interested in books? Which shows? Which stories? Do they watch sports? Which type of sports? Which teams do they like? Uh, what have those teams had to deal with lately? You know, you can make the references that make you seem like somebody that they can communicate with. And you actually would be, because you've taken the time to learn how they think. And this is a skill useful not just in interviewing, but very powerful in your career as a whole. Once you have all this information, you need to reposition yourself. Okay? The information that's on the internet is there forever. Sort of. Google's been exploring right to be forgotten. Okay? There are ways to get data off. Other companies that index what Google indexes may not have the ability to remove data. Okay? Think of Google and Bing as lenses that focus in on aspects that matter. Okay? Most people will not bother searching past the first page on either of these. Okay? They'll look on Bing because Internet Explorer is built into Windows and most people still have Internet Explorer as their primary browser. Anybody that's using Firefox or Chrome will use Google as the primary because the vast majority of people will not bother changing the default search engines. So search both and make sure your presence for the first three pages on both is clean. Um, now, what you want to do is create a custom resume for the company you've targeted. You know, you've got your list of five companies, it's the ones that care about you, but you're going to be targeting one at a time. That means you can target the resume to each one. And uh, by crafting the resume that looks like you know, each, each story, each storyline has been rephrased to plant um, interesting metaphors where you can. And you've cut out all the stories you don't want to tell that would not interest them. You get it down to one page. That then becomes the primary thing on your website. 
which will drive search engine around those areas and then as you target them, when they check you out, they'll go there and say, hey, this person looks interesting. Um, <clears throat> you can also uh, come up with a custom cover letter if you're going with a traditional approach. If you're doing a custom cover letter or if you're doing a custom video cover letter, you want to have very basic three paragraph. Paragraph one, introduce yourself, your skills, and why you're awesome. Okay. Should not take much time, just really quick. This is why I'm neat. Paragraph two, explain why you think they're awesome. Okay? Because they're more likely to hire you if they think they let you if they think you like them. And then the last paragraph, state your intent to call them. Give the three times you're going to call them, dates and specific times, and you say, I would like to talk more. If you want to call me, here's my information, and then you're done. Because the next step is on those dates, on those times, give a call. Make that demonstrates follow through in a way that they have to do nothing. And you will just with that alone stand above everybody else trying to get into that business. Hiring managers love people with follow through. They also hate answering the phone. So plan to leave a voicemail. Build a voicemail script. Actually, build three of them so you're not leaving the same voicemail three times. Uh, but build the voicemail script that says, uh, this is my name. Uh, as I said in my cover, in my letter, my email, whatever, I was going to call you this time, this day. Uh, I'm interested in talking with you. Here's my contact information. I will call you again on X. Do that three times. If you, they don't get back to you within three times, target somebody else in the organization or target another organization but it's going to make you much more memorable than everybody else. Oh, and that's an example of a cover letter, which is probably too small for you to read from back there. When they call you, schedule time to talk. One of the biggest failures people make in a phone interview is saying, yes, I have time right now. The correct answer is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm heading off to a business meeting, but I'll be available Thursday at 3. Okay? Give yourself two to three days of advanced lead time, even if you've got nothing else going on. Give yourself two to three days of lead time. And because what you want to say is, all right, I'll be available to talk at this time, who will I be talking with? And, you know, just what's your name? If you don't call me, what number should I call? Okay? Because that gives you first name, last name, phone number, which you can search on for specific information of the person you know you're going to be talking to. If you have that information, you then have two to three days to tweak whatever stories you're going to tell to match their interests. You also have two to three days to plan the location you're going to be working from. Okay? You want a location that has internet access, so you can do lookups during the interview if they ask you something you don't know right away. You want to have multiple tabs open with a blank Google in each one, so you can very quickly search for the information you need. You want access to the text documents you created as you made this, this information. Um, a tablet will work. Um, I prefer to print them out because I'm older and I like paper. Um, but you want, you want that information at your fingertips. You want to be able to stand up because people standing up project more. You sound more interesting. And uh, what I like is to hang a mirror and smile as you talk. Because if you're smiling, you sound friendlier. So this often works best at a bathroom counter or hang a mirror in your kitchen, standing up with all the information standing out in front of you. You have two goals in the phone interview. Number one, land a real interview. Number two, get the information you need to succeed at the real interview. So you're going to assuage any concerns they have, because hiring managers, you know, the people on the phone, their job is to get you out, not get you in. So you want to make sure that any concerns they have are handled. Then say, all right, when do you want me to come in? What's the address? What's the time? Who will I be meeting with? Who they might they bring in later? You know, get the list of the team that will be interviewing you and schedule it for a week out. A week will then give you time to gather personal data on the three to five people you'll be interviewing with and to do the actual interview process, which involves a portfolio. So if you have an in-person interview, you want to take control of that interview. And that means you need something to leave behind. 
Why do you want something to leave behind? Because you don't know who's coming in after you. Somebody coming in after you will be more interesting because they'll be more recent. If you have something you leave behind, then you are, in effect, present for each interview after you. I like to use the two folder approach. On one side, in one pocket, you have a cover letter. This would be a written form of any video that you may have done. It may be the infographic, it may be a traditional cover letter. Up to you, depends on what makes you most comfortable. You're gonna have the customized resume, one page behind that. If you're old like me, maybe two pages. Um, and examples of previous work, okay? About three examples that just so this is the kind of work I've done. In the other pocket, custom materials you've created for the interview. By this point, you know what business you're targeting, you know what problems they have, you know what solutions you're suggesting, so it's very easy to mock up two or three examples of what you're talking about. The custom is where you're gonna stand out. This is where you're gonna show off market research. You know, very easy to find this is the business competition, this is the products they have, these are the problems the products solve, and make one of those grids that have all those check marks that say this company does X, Y, and Z. And if you find something nobody's doing, you can have a nice line with no checks that you can then point to an interview and say, this is the market opportunity. You, know, you can identify these gaps, whether they're disruptive forces or things people haven't thought of yet and you can do this competitive ranking. Now, when you do the competitive ranking, never put your target business on the list because it's very easy for a business to say, well, actually, we do do this, but they're not going to other competition nearly as well. You can very easily become the expert in the company at that company's competition. Um, okay. You also want to think about flow documents. A flow document shows how you solve problems, and this could be any problem a business has. Maybe they have a problem selling. You know, maybe the problem is they can't, when they sit down in front of a com customer, explain why their product is better than somebody else's. Maybe they can't explain in front of a customer why the customer's problem needs to be solved at all. And that's a pretty standard flow process. Just a few interviews with a few salespeople, you can identify this is a basic flow process. You throw in some custom <coughs> graphics to make it match the interviewer's interest, and then point out and say, so where in the process are you having a problem? Do this in IT. You know, email is a tangle in every business. Data is a mess in every single business in the world. And it's very easy to go in and say, this is how I clean up data messes. Because nobody else has the time. So you can walk in and handle that. Um, if you're interested in new product development, show about how you bundle products and services together in ways that are unique in the, business, in the industry. Okay? Just good ways to stand out. Now, there's a sneaky little trick that I recommend people do. Now, in 10, 15 years, everybody's going to know this trick. You'll have to come up with something new. Uh, but include one typo in one document. And then when you get to that document in an interview, take out your pen and circle it. And say, I'm sorry, there's a typo here. I'll get you a fixed document. Why do you do that? You do that because after the interview, you want to email them the corrected version of the document to show that you have follow through. And then they have another version of the document sitting around. And when you come in for the second interview, you can have a corrected version and say, hey, I fixed this. Here it is. Um, now, this seems overwhelming and expensive, but it's really not. Okay, when I do it, I use Inkscape, GIMP, and LibreOffice, all of them free open source tools. Um, there are online tutorials for how to use all of these. This is a very grainy example of what some of these documents look like. So this is a bundling idea where you show um, how you're bundling different things together and the average level of difficulty it takes to do that sort of bundling. This is a flow document that shows how information flows through an organization and this is one of those uh, checklists kind of show. Now, you can get graphics by doing Google searches on file type at dot .svg, okay? Any SVG will be pulled straight into Inkscape. It's like an open source Adobe Illustrator if you know that tool. Um, now, you don't want to use somebody else's intellectual property, but SVGs are very editable. Uh, you can get inspiration from them. You can take pieces out and tweak them. You can do Creative Commons searches to find all sorts of things you can use. 
Um, you can match color and font by doing color and font searches against a business. The website, you can just go to view source. Uh, you could do screen caps and use the little color picker so that everything matches the company's brand and they'll look at that and go, you know, it looks perfect because it completely matches their brand. Um, you don't want to be a great designer. You want to look better than average. Don't go for complexity, go for simplicity. Simplicity, color matching, uh, as few words as possible. Those three rules are the three rules for great design. Um, if you have gone through the metaphor mapping exercise and you know how your targets think, come up with visual metaphors. You know, if they're football fans, put football goalposts, uh, footballs, helmets for protection, all, all of these visual metaphors work really well. Um, and then you're going to want to have a business card. Okay? Business cards take maybe an evening to design and about 20 bucks at FedEx Kinko's to print out a business card that's customized to a particular job opportunity. Well worth the investment. You want it to stand out and you want it to have contact info and that's it. Avoid making it uh, look looking cute, but definitely go for daring. There's nothing wrong with saying on a business card, you know, job applicant, or my personal favorite, employee of the month, 20, November 2015. Okay? Stuff like that, you know, a little bit ballsy, not too much, just enough for them to go, you know, this person's interesting, well, let's go with them. Uh, if you want inspiration, a Google image search for best business cards, tons of inspiration. Okay, one of the things I do that only works with the, the pocket folder if you have a vertical, but I turn my, my business cards on the edge, you know, on the side, because that's different. Most people don't bother to do that. Everybody remembers it. I've got a friend that invested probably a hundred bucks in solid aluminum business cards. He sells security. Nobody else has aluminum business cards Everybody remembers when he hands him a card. And in that stack of business cards, everybody sees it. Um, one thing people have done, I don't know if you noticed uh, about five years ago, you're probably a little too young. Um, certain credit cards started running um, a yellow stock and then layering plastic on the front and back. So it looks like a regular business card, but if it's in a, if it's in a wallet, the one you're looking for is that yellow stripe. Okay. That sort of thing makes you stand out. So just think about what is, what's going to happen to this document, what's going to happen to this business card, this thing I'm making in a week, in two weeks. Where is it going to be? How can I make it stand out in that situation without making it look garish when I hand it to somebody today? Okay. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about money. Who's been previously employed full-time? Nobody. Okay. A um, couple of people, maybe. Now, one of the hardest things going for your second job is the question you're going to be asked is, well, what are you making today? And that question is going to lock you in at that salary level forever. Okay? Because if they know what you're making, they're going to offer 5% more and say, take it or leave it. But if you go through a total compensation calculation, that number can be a lot higher. And this avoids that standard percent change when you change jobs. And this includes everything. Okay? Start with the salary and add on bonuses, commissions, costs for classes, travel, food, lodging, anything the company gives you for that. Um, add the money they pay to maintain certificates or licenses. Um, add the insurance costs. Now that Obamacare's passed, you know what your insurance can cost. You can just go online and you know what would it cost for me to get the same level of coverage I've got now add that in. Um, add any retirement contributions they make. Calculate what you're paid for sick days and vacation time. Add that in. Add in the costs of your tools, your laptop, your software. That is the total compensation you make. It's not your salary, it's total comp. And then you take the total comp and you add new things you want. You know, more frequent trainings, uh, more vacation time, costs of living changes if you move to another city. From that number, do a, uh, a plus or minus 10%, and that's your asking range. So when they say, what are you looking for? How much are you making now? You can say, oh, my total comp is X. And uh, I'm looking for a range of A to B. 
that's <coughs> higher than x to move. And that'll then give them something that's reasonable that you can say exactly why you want this, well, what you need, and uh, you know, makes it more realistic. Okay. And then we get into interview prep. So these are basic things you want to do before the interview. Step number one is pre-drive to the location. Okay. You want to make sure you can get there in time. Drive the same time of the day you're going to be going. You don't want to be stuck in traffic and be late for the interview. When you're there, drive through the lot. Look at the cars. Look at bumper stickers. Look at the cost of the cars. Uh, more expensive cars mean both they pay the people better and it's a status-based organization. Cars that have, or parking lots that have really expensive cars in the executive spots and everybody else is driving beaters means you're not going to be paid well and the executives are going to take as much money for themselves as they can. Uh, that's a lot less of a problem here in the uh, Midwest, but uh, you'll notice it strongly on the coasts. Um, if you don't live there, go with Google Maps, and particularly go with Street View to do the pre-drive mentally. Okay? Um, use geolocation searches. Used to be a tool called Pushpin that's been merged into ReconNG, which allows you to look for photos in particular areas. And you can often find photos taken inside buildings with this sort of search. And why does that matter? Because if you know what people are dressed like, whether it's from photos from inside the building, or sitting at a coffee house for a day watching people come in and out of the office. Um, you can take those pictures to a professional clothier and say, I want to look like this, but one step better. You don't have to know anything about fashion. They will dress you, and you will look good. And you don't have to worry about it after that, because they know <coughs> if you get the job, you'll be back for more clothes. Okay. Don't go to a department store, spend the money, Go to an actual clothing or you know, one suit, you know, one, one interview dress, whatever you prefer, good investment. Now, if you're sitting in a coffee shop watching the business for a day, take note of when people show up and leave. If everybody shows up between 7.45 and 8, and nobody shows up after 8, you know they're a stickler for start time. If everybody leaves at noon versus people leaving between 11 and 1, you know what kind of job it is. Okay, the same thing when people go home at the end of the day. If everybody leaves and before 5 and at 5 nobody's leaving versus everybody starts leaving at 5.30 and just kind of trails out after that, you know what expectation is as far as how you work. You can also, by noting those times, know when your interview is going to end. And if you know when the interview is going to end, you can plant the hooks during the conversation so at the end of the interview it's like, I'm sorry, I've got to go to lunch. Do you want to come with me? Or let's reschedule for tomorrow to continue this conversation, both of which are wins. Okay. Um, now, also for interview prep, uh, you are going to be asked dumb questions. Okay. You are going to be far more prepared for this interview than they will be to interview you. And if that's the case, they're going to be asking you some pretty stupid stuff. Like, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, the answer to where you see yourself in five years is happily employed, making more money, and not doing crap work. Nobody wants to hear that answer. So you need something better that is not challenging to their position, but makes you look like you're going to work hard and not try to you know, be a, a sole point in the business. Um, a good way to do this is to get an audio book from the library on interview prep and practice in the car, in your home, uh, you know, play back the question and answer. And it's going to be awkward as hell the first time. But as you go through it, it's going to take most people three to seven times through the list of questions before the pattern just flows off. Because what you want to get to is with each stupid question, you want to have an answer that leads back to a point on the resume. Because each point on the resume is a story. And if you can get telling stories, you've taken control of the interview. And that's the point. You want to get them off script as soon as possible. And then when you do that, plant the conversation hooks because you want to end at a high interest level. Which gets you into the actual interview. The, end, the point of the interview is to answer five questions. Do I want to do the work? Will I fit into the culture here? 
are they willing to pay me enough to compensate for any negatives? And are they willing to pay me enough to accomplish my financial goals? Finally, how do I advance this process? Because if the answer to all four of them are positive, then you want to either get an offer or an interview with somebody higher up to give you an offer. If they're not willing to advance the interview, they're wasting your time, and you should go on to the next business. Look for opportunities to shore the portfolio. You know, if a question can lead to the resume, pull out the resume and say, oh, I have an updated resume here. Let's look at this, okay? If the question leads to your research, pull out one of your research documents. Um, and then again, go through that whole typo thing I mentioned. As soon as that portfolio comes out of your bag and lands on the table, the game has changed and they have no idea what's going on. You can completely take over and just lead them down the path to offer you a job. Refer to the documents as much as possible. Most times, within five to 10 minutes, they're just gonna cede control to you and it's gonna turn into a conversation that you're running. Um, if asked for something you didn't prepare for, turn one of your documents over and sketch on the back. Be willing to completely deface any document you've created because any document you can deface is one you can take with you at the end of the interview or snap a copy with your phone just to remember and at the end send them say based on our conversation here's a new document or here's an updated version again keeping you in front of them at all times yeah. and if possible sketch on a whiteboard <coughs> why do you want to sketch on a whiteboard because whiteboards are never erased red stands out and your name will be up there forever Okay. Every interview they have in that office, in that conference room, your name will be there, sitting up as a constant reminder that whoever they're interviewing today is worse than you because they didn't write on the whiteboard. <clears throat> Take notes as you go through the process. One page per interviewer and um, use that for the next round because you want to send thank you emails that night. Okay, you want to, with each email, include updated versions of the documents uh, and, you know, that deliberate typo, you want to correct that, send that, could be one document, could be five documents. Uh, you want to um, write out thank you notes by hand, but write them on the computer first, typo check, grammar check, make sure all that's good, and uh, drop those thank you notes in the mail the next day. Why do you do that? Because after the first interview, that they come in the next morning to an email from you thanking them for their time. Two days after that, they get something in the mail thanking them for their time. And you reference during all this point, you know, when am I going to be checking in? You know, before you leave, you'll know when to check in. You reference in the email and in the thank you note, you know, looking forward to talking to you on day. You know, at the end of the day, you give them a call. Say, hey, haven't heard from you and go through that three times, usually by that point you will have uh, you know, the second interview or the offer or something like that. If you don't, <coughs> go through the same process with the next company. Every industry has at least one good company that's gonna to respond to this, and most of them are gonna be pretty high up on your list. Which gets into salary negotiation. So it's the same graphic as earlier. You're gonna to have to check the offer, okay? Offers are gonna come in two flavors open to discussion or take it take it or leave it okay take it or leave it you're going to find in your bigger companies your um, your municipalities your state government jobs um, and you know if it's latter if it's a good enough job take it you can always find another job otherwise if it's a discussion uh, negotiate from fairness find a way you know don't just try to get as much money as you can <coughs> you can really sour the relationship by over negotiating it Beginning, but you don't want to roll over either. Okay? If they offer you something that you don't think is fair, tell them why it's not fair. You know, and try why it's not fair to them and why it's not fair to you. Okay? Um, and look at uh, non-objective metrics. Uh, be careful of performance pay. A lot of companies will say, well, if you do well, we'll give you more money. But they don't define what well means. If they do define what well means, usually well is dependent on other people in the organization. You don't want to be penalized because you are paid based on lazy salespeople. Okay? So you want to negotiate, if performance pay comes up, 
say, all right, what are my metrics? What am I going to be measured on? And then talk through each one. This is how this can go well. This is how this can go wrong. And anything that's out of your control, say, I'm really not comfortable being paid on how well this person does if I'm not responsible for making that person better. Okay. Um, negotiation basics. Be fair. Know when to stop. And remember the organization's needs. It's not about you. It's about the two of you together. The goal is to find a solution that maximizes the benefit for both parties. If you're leaving a job, you're going to want to give notice. Um, most of you are not going to be in this position for a few years yet. But when it comes time, there are going to be two types of scenarios. There are three, really. One, they're going to let you go on the spot. Two, they're going to uh, give you a counteroffer. And three, they're going, to, um, they're going to ask you to stay through the end of the time and say, all right, at the end, you're done. Immediate, plan for immediate termination. Take everything you want home the day before, or if you're planning for this for a while, slowly over about a week, so people don't notice things are going. If they challenge you, say, I'm just cleaning up my desk. Okay, It got messy. I can't work this way. I, I want to make things a little bit cleaner. Um, if they give you a counter offer, um, in almost all cases, don't take it. Okay, it's, it's a game you can play once, and it very seldom is going to wind up in your favor. Um, consider benefits. You know, it used to be there's a health insurance gap, still sort of exists in the U.S., but you've got more options. A uh, good time to have your last day is on the first of the next month, because that means any benefits that are monthly are going to continue through the end of that month. And then you can negotiate with the company you're going to, say, hey, I would like my benefits to start day one of the following month, and you don't have any gap to worry about. Okay. Um, think about retirement. There's some interesting uh, financial games you can play. Talk with a, a CPA or a financial consultant, because a lot of times it's better to roll your 401k into your own control instead of just rolling it to the next company, because of various reasons I'm not going to get into here. But think about that. Uh, if you've signed non-compete agreements, review them first and involve a lawyer ahead of time if you need to. Almost all non-competes can be negotiated really easily, but you have to know that the potential problem exists so you can get in front of it. And finally, a lot of people take data from their business just to protect themselves in the future. Um, I've never known anybody that's actually used that, so there's a risk. There's a real risk in taking somebody else's data with you, and if it's not going to be useful, you might want to consider not doing it, because that can get you in a lot of trouble later. Okay, when all this planning is done, give the notice in writing, just walk into the boss's desk at a time you know they're available, and say, hey, I'm sorry, but I've got this other offer, I've got to go, here's the letter, I'll let you read it, let me know if you want to talk, and leave. Um, talked about counteroffers being a game you can play once, um, exit interviews. Most companies, when you leave, have an exit interview. And they say, tell us what we could have done better, we want to improve. They don't want to know. Nobody wants to know. If they wanted to know, they would have asked earlier and you would have fixed it then. So, with the exit interview, be polite. Say, it was time for a change, I want a new challenge. This is not the time to vent. Because, the other job you're going to may not work out. And if you don't burn this bridge, if you keep it nice and clean and just say, look, I wanted this challenge. I'm still friends with everybody here. I love to work in here. I'd like to work here again at some point in the future. I just have to pursue this for personal <coughs> reason. If that falls apart, you've got a safety net. Okay? Now, these are the resources I used as I went through writing this book. And I can leave them up and you can write them all down, or you can just buy the book. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I read a lot. Um, here's the QR code for the book, and uh, I'll leave that up for a little bit. Uh, question time. Yes? What do you do if you have a job prospect that looks really good on paper, everything looks like something that you would like, and then you get to the interview and just realize that the job is not for you. How do you handle that situation? There's nothing wrong with uh, ending the interview, with saying, you know, I've, I've got other interviews that I'm going through. 
Um, if you're offered, say, I'll let you know soon and uh, think about it. You don't just want to walk out, um, but you know, it's perfectly fine <coughs> to say, you know, I don't think this is right for me right now. Okay? Um, I would not end the interview early. I would go through the entire process because you never know if something doesn't pan out. Sometimes you just have to take a job. But uh, I wouldn't string them along unnecessarily. Does that answer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Come on, this is your chance. Yes. Um, from a college person's perspective on um, Facebook and Twitter, we all know that we're not allowed to post. We shouldn't post things that are inappropriate. Um, and I've always been pointed at the tool brand yourself. Yeah. Uh, to like I've used that. Kind of bury what you don't want and and um, hire the stuff that you do. The issue that I've always run into is my name is Holly Miller. It's so generic that no matter what I do, there's uh, is there any um, two cents you can put into like helping people with such generic names? I'm sure you. Yeah. Have the same issue. Yeah. Um, there, there have been more Josh Morris coming. I was one of the first ones on the internet, so I had some yeah. advantage there. Um, use your middle name. Uh, that's often a common one. Uh, people have changed their names. Uh, there's not a lot you can really do there. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more unique names in the next 20 years because of this problem. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, change your name is really the best option and you have a professional name. <laughs> yeah. With a lot of us with a limited background uh, as far as things to show that we've done in the past in either a few school work projects or one previous employer, how does that look in that portfolio if all of your stuff is coming from one specific thing? Um, most people aren't going to notice simply because having a portfolio mm -hmm. is, sets you up, up above everybody else. Uh, however, what, what are you going to be looking? Uh, I'll be going into security awareness or pen testing, and most of my experience will come from a security awareness campaign here on campus. Okay, and is that in a year? Is yeah. That in a year? Okay. You have a year then to join any sort of open source project for awareness. You know, make videos. You know, make some, uh, you know, take a summer and just make documents, make free things out there. Uh, there are requirements under both HIPAA and PCI to engage in uh, regular awareness training and just put some stuff out there for free. Uh, that then becomes your portfolio. Outside of work. Yeah, yeah, outside of work. Anyone else? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Josh.